All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Joseph, and my pronouns are he, him, his. Hi, y'all. My name is Jesse Alex, and my pronouns are they, them, theirs. And we're the Historical Research Fellows at Montgomery Pride United. And today, we're going to talk about a very important yet overlooked figure in U.S. history. Um, when we consider transformational movements throughout the 20th century, we typically look to the American Civil Rights Movement. Others may think about the anti-war movement, women's movement, and gay liberation movement. And the person you're learning about now was influential in almost all of these movements. His name is Bayard Rustin. The lives of people the figure like Bayard Rustin have been the subject of countless biographies, but few have had Rustin's impact on many of the last century's major social movements. So who exactly was he? Well, let's start with his early life. Rustin was born in Westchester, Pennsylvania in 1912 to Florence Rustin, a teenager at the time. And Florence had a budding relationship with a man named R.T. Hopkins, a laborer by trade, although the two never married or raised Rustin. However, Bayard had caring grandparents, Julia and Jennifer Rustin, who served as parental figures in his life. They were well respected in the small black community in Westchester and young Jennifer migrated to the city originally in the 1880s. As a young man, he met Julia and the two married in 1891. To support the household, Jennifer was employed as a steward at the local Elks Lodge, while Julia worked as a nurse. And Mrs. Julia Rustin in particular had a strong influence on Bayer's early life. For example, she passed on to him Quaker values that she embraced as a child growing up in Quaker communities. She also sparked to him a strong race consciousness by hosting race leaders such as W.E.B. Du Bois, James Weldon Johnson, and Mary McLeod Bethune, along with being a member of the National Association, of Colored, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or NAACP, founded in 1909. This early exposure to Quaker religious traditions and racial justice shaped Rust's worldview and how he thought of society. Even in high school, when he was reading Emily Dickinson and Will Durant's The Story of Philosophy, it became clear that he felt a moral imperative to shape the world around him. And to illustrate his love for social justice, here's a poem written by young Bayard. I ask of you no shining gold, I seek no epitaph or fame, no monument of stone for me, for man need never speak my name. But when my flesh doth waste away and seeks seeds from stately trees do blow, I pray that in my fertile clay, you gently let a small seed grow. That seed, I pray, be evergreen, that in my dust may always be, that everlasting life and joy you manifest in that green tree. The poem reflects Rustin's desire to find a larger purpose in his work. And it also explains his gravitation towards pacifism and racial equality in his later life. In 1932, he graduated from Westchester High School and moved out to Western Ohio after receiving a music scholarship to Wilberforce University. There, he became a member of the Wilberforce Singers, renowned for his baritone tenor voice. By 1934, Rustin left Wilberforce as a due to refusal to participate in mandatory ROTC activities or organizing a student strike to improve the quality of food on campus. The exact reason is still unknown. He then spent a brief stint at Cheney State Teachers College back home. During this time, Rustin organized the college's conference for the Institute of International Relations, sponsored by the American Friends Service Committee, or AFSC. AFSC was a fragment of the peace movement that had grown in the aftermath of World War I. Rustin's connection with this organization in his youth is significant when considering his later involvement in the peace movement. During his youth, Rustin also recalled feeling attraction to some of his male classmates. His family seemed to be accepting of Rustin's romantic friendships during his childhood, but unfortunately, he was ridiculed and treated unfairly throughout his life for his relationships. Davis Platt, Rustin's partner in 1943, recalled, for example, that his mentor at Cheney State, Dr. Hill, had learned of his relationship with another young man. Platt's recollection actually suggests that it may have even prompted Rustin to finally move to Harlem. 
And indeed, in 1937, he moved in with his Aunt Bessie in Harlem. As Rustin made connections with activists on the American left, a friend introduced him to A.J. Must, the head of the Fellowship of Reconciliation, or FOUR, founded in 1915. We'll learn more about him in a little bit. By that time, Rustin had already traveled throughout New York, working as a volunteer for AFSC, which included teaching about pacifism. Must hired him as a field secretary for the four in 1941, and this was the beginning of Rustin's long activist career. Now let's take a look at how Rustin's philosophy of life actually transformed in his early activist years. So this quote that we have here was actually taken from one of his letters. He says, there are four ways in which one can deal with an injustice. One can accept it without protest. One can seek to avoid it. One can resist the injustice nonviolently, or one can resist by violence. In 1944, Rustin actually wrote this letter to the warden of the Ashland Federal Correctional Institution in Kentucky. And the letter describes the benefits of nonviolence as a method of protest. While we tend to focus on the civil rights movement when we think of nonviolence, Rustin developed this life philosophy a decade before the movement. Many may be familiar, for example, of this well-known image of Rustin, who's with Dr. King, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Reverend Ralph Abernathy. Believe it or not, Rustin taught King about nonviolence when the Montgomery Improvement Association chose the young minister to lead the bus boycott. However, as we'll see later, the two did not meet until 1956. And going back briefly to before the peace movement, pacifists, some of whom were conscientious objective, objectors during World War II, experimented with nonviolence. Rustin, who by the 1940s had committed to pacifism, adopted nonviolence as a way of life. He deployed it in protests against segregated seating at Ashland and on public transportation in the late 1940s. And between 1941 and 1944, Rustin connected with many of these organizations and activists working for peace and racial equality. They included, for example, the American Friends Service Committee, AFSC, the Fellowship of Reconciliation, or FOUR, the March on Washington Movement, MOWM, the War Resisters League, WRL, and the Congress of Racial Equality, which was also known as CORE. One of his mentors, A.J. Must, who we described a little bit earlier, actually shaped Rustin's career the most. Must was born in 1885 in the Netherlands, and he was raised in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Educated in the Dutch Reformed Church, Must trained to be a minister and later presided over a liberal congregational church outside Boston. The years that Must spent as a minister coincided with Four's early operations the peace advocates formed in response to World War I. And by 1940, he renewed his commitment to nonviolence and pacifism after participating in labor organizing. Mus's background in labor unions aligned with Rustin's experience as a Young Communist League or YCL member in the 1930s. The two shared a vision of nonviolence as a way of life. As a result, Must expanded Rustin's role as a field secretary for four, as we mentioned earlier. His responsibilities included traveling across the country and talking to thousands of people about nonviolent direct action and racial justice. Although Rustin was an integral part of FOUR, his relationship with Musk and the organization became strained over time. The tension resulted from the stigma attached to his sexual orientation. Musk frequently, for example, discouraged his relationships with men. And one particular incident included the period from 1944 to 1946, when Rustin was incarcerated for draft evasion. In a letter dated October 26, 1944, Rustin actually wrote to Mustin in distress. In it, he wrote, I have violated the trust which Ford and the WRL had in me. At the moment when success was imminent in our racial campaign, my behavior stopped progress. I have caused them, my fellow inmates, to question the moral basis of nonviolence. This letter was actually a response to Mustard's criticism of Rustin's relationships with men, which the warden used actually to delegitimize Rustin's integration efforts at the prison. Must, who has supported Rustin throughout much of his imprisonment, 
wrote a letter bashing Rustin for being reckless, stubborn, and prideful. He believed Rustin's sexuality would damage his image and de diminish the causes he cared about, explicitly referring to Rustin's integration efforts at the prison. From Rustin's response, it is also clear that his mentor's opinion mattered a lot to him. He understood his life as a moral crusade, and he internalized the value judgments placed on his sexuality. Despite the strain, however, Rustin was still active and pretty unapologetic about his views as a peace activist and race leader. One of his early publications called The Interracial Primer, How You Can relieve, Help Relieve Tension Between Negroes and Whites, demonstrates Rustin's views on race relations. In it, he challenges predominantly white pacifists and church congregations across the country to personally commit to combating racism. This publication and his speaking tours were influential because Rustin had a talent for captivating audiences. His dedication earned him acclaim, not just in four, but also the um, March on Washington movement. And MOWM was established by labor leader and socialist A. Philip Randolph, the head, the, the head of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. Although Randolph was already well known for his excellent public speaking and his involvement with labor unions in New York City, his 1941 March on Washington movement, MOWM, made him a household name in Black America. He planned the march to protest racial discrimination in the military and defense industries at the start of World War II. Employment discrimination had been a major issue for African Americans since World War II, when many migrated from the rural South to the North and Midwest. The Great Depression, the economic crisis of 1929, only worsened African Americans' financial hardships in these urban spaces. Eventually, Randolph's march pressured President Franklin D. Roosevelt to create the Fair Employment Practices Committee and prohibit racial discrimination in the federal government and defense industries. And in response, Randolph canceled the rally. And although he did cancel the march, the MLWM actually remained an organization through which he continued to fight for racial equality. After consulting with Musk, Randolph sought out Rustin and his colleague, George Hauser, to continue the work of the MLWM. In 1946, after Rustin was released from prison, he further resumed his work for four and led a major project for the newly formed Congress of Racial Equality, or CORE. His plan was to test the Supreme Court decision in Morgan versus Virginia from June 1946, which prohibited segregated sitting on interstate travel. And with an, inter -group, with an interracial group of volunteers, as you can see in this picture, Rustin traveled from Washington, D.C. to North Carolina on the Journey of Reconciliation, which was also known as the First Freedom Ride. The trip proved that for bus companies were still enforcing segregation on interstate travel in the South when Rustin and other activists were arrested in Durham, North Carolina. He would later be forced to serve a 22-day prison sentence on a chain gang in Roxborough in 1949. After the New York Post published a report by Rustin describing the prisoners' inhumane treatment on these gangs, the state finally abolished chain gangs completely. And between the 1947 journey and his 1949 sentence, Rustin practiced nonviolent direct action in other ways. In June 1948, Congress passed a conscription bill that failed to desegregate the military and ban racial discrimination. Rustin and George Hauser launched a League for Nonviolent Civil Disobedience that served as the bill's resistance campaign. They assembled a staff of nearly 12 workers who engaged young men in conversations outside the conscription offices. The effort was significant for, for its acknowledgement that African Americans have served in the armed forces since the nation's foundings, and yet they were still treated as second-class citizens. Interesting. So when did the military actually become integrated? Well, President Harry Truman desegregated the military in 1948, shortly after Rustin and Hauser's campaign. But we should remember one more thing about World War II and Rustin's view on militarism. Although he did work to end segregation in the military, he was still highly critical of war itself. Right, because he was a pacifist. Mm -hmm. So is there a difference between pacifism and nonviolence? 
that's actually a really great question and one which our audience may be wondering too. So typically they are terms we hear together, but it's important to distinguish them by saying that pacifism is an ideology or a set of ideas or beliefs that people should reject violence in all areas of life, including war. But nonviolence, on the other hand, is a practice. And yet some people like Rustin have described it as a way of life. So that means that people can practice nonviolence, but not consider themselves to be a pacifist or a person who does not believe in the use of violence in any situation. Exactly. And speaking of, in the same year of Rustin's campaign against the conscription bill, he embarked on a journey to India, which had become well known by this time for Gandhian nonviolence. And a lot of you may have heard of Mahatma Gandhi, the Indian anti-colonial leader who contributed to the movement for Indian independence from Great Britain. When news of Gandhi and other Indian leaders' nonviolent efforts spread worldwide, African Americans found inspiration in this practice, including Rustin himself. Wow, and while the 1940s was an exciting time for Rustin, he did not always have the opportunity to truly make the impact that he desired. He experienced, for example, a lot of difficulty as an activist. For one, his arrests at various protests and incarceration during World War II were isolating times in his life. While the government and law enforcement charged that he broke the law by evading the draft or protesting interstate travel, Rustin was standing up for the values he believed in. We could talk more about how this has impacted social justice movements and activists over time, but after the video, we actually invite students to consider how the laws sometimes grant certain rights and at other times infringe on individual rights. Should Rustin, for example, have been able to demonstrate his beliefs in these ways? That is a very good point and something very important to think about. And there was another difficulty as well. And on top, on top of these things, Rustin was also arrested for simply being himself. In 1953, he was arrested on moral charges in Pasadena, California, as you can see in this newspaper clipping. The incident marked a turning point in Rustin's activist career, unfortunately one in which many of his colleagues in the four turned their backs on him due to his sexuality. And back then, there were laws that made it illegal for gay men and lesbians to publicly display affection. And in these cases, police often charged LGBT people for what they viewed as immoral behavior. And this may actually be shocking for us to consider today. Um, but in the 21st century, LGBT people have more legal protections and are more widely accepted in society. But this wasn't always the case. And in the 1950s, for example, they were considered a minority in the U.S. Religion, primarily Christianity, influenced the majority of Americans' understanding of sexuality and morality. This empowered lawmakers and politicians to discriminate against gay men and lesbians. This discriminatory treatment was not just limited to gay men and lesbians either. LGBT people, also known as LGBTQIA people, which stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer such questioning, intersex, and asexual people have always faced some level of discrimination in American society. And Rustin's life shows us how this often negatively impacted and threatened the livelihood of these communities. So let's take a look at what happens to Rustin after his arrest. Of the people who distanced themselves from Rustin, A.J. Must was one. He asked Rustin to resign from four, which was the end of his 12 year career in the organization. The good news is that Rustin was hired by the War Resisters League, which was a secular pacifist organization that didn't pressure him to hide his sexuality. His new job with the WRL enabled Rustin to continue pacifist and racial justice work, and it actually eventually led to him coming to Montgomery, Alabama in 1956. So remember that picture of Dr. King and Rustin from earlier? Well, this is the part of the story where the two finally joined forces to make nonviolence a central organizing feature of the civil rights movement. Rustin traveled to Montgomery in February 1956 as a representative of End Friendship, an organization of Northern liberals who raised funds for Black activists in the South. By this time, Rustin had over a decade of experience in applying nonviolence to social causes. 
He served as an advisor for King during the Montgomery bus boycott, which famously led to the end of racial segregation on city buses. Rustin also produced working papers, as you can see here, on his observations of the bus boycott's mass potential to, uh, to sustain the momentum for racial justice work in the South. He recognized that the boycott's overall economic power over white city officials, the bus company, and businessmen. He considered two primary questions in these documents. One, do we civil rights activists need a coordinating group for advice and counsel among the present protest group? And two, should such a council try to stimulate bus protests in other areas of the South? In addition to this commentary on the questions, he outlines a way forward regarding nonviolent civil disobedience and the law. And these papers would provide some of the framework for the formation of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, also known as the SCLC, which was a civil rights organization of Southern Black ministers. Today, he is more well known for organizing the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. In terms of size and scope, this march was a huge success. 250,000 people gathered in the National Mall in Washington, D.C. on August 28th to support civil rights legislation and job opportunities for African Americans. In many ways, it represented a high point in the movement. Six major civil rights organizations were represented, including the NAACP, SCLC, SNCC, or the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, CORE, the National Urban League, and the Negro American Labor Council. These national organizations and their leaders were not entirely representative of the Black community's uh, involvement uh, in grassroots work. For example, local leaders and groups played a large role also throughout the 1950s and 1960s in supporting these national leaders and workers within the Big Six, uh, which was actually a nickname for the six major civil rights organizations at the march. Unfortunately, Black women were also overlooked for leadership roles in these organizations, although they contributed equal amounts, if not more than their male counterparts in constructing nonviolent uh, nonviolence trainings, protests, and voter registration campaigns. Over time, historians of the civil rights movement have actually made this important distinction as well, that the movement was made by ordinary African Americans, including African American women, in their diligent efforts towards racial equality. And Weston deeply understood this grassroots organizing tradition, which explains why he was able to fill the role of organizer and spokesman in the organizations he worked in. And although he was known more as the behind the scenes man of the march, here's actually a video clip of what he had to say on that very day. Bring to you the executive director of the March on Washington, the man who organized this whole thing, Mr. Bayard Rustin. Wow, that was really powerful. Um, but why did Rustin play such an important role in the civil rights movement, yet he wasn't considered a leader back then? Mm, that's a great question. Well, remember what we said earlier about LGBT discrimination in America? It was an ongoing struggle for Rustin and others like him to live freely. Rustin, as a black gay man, was frequently a target of the FBI, Republican politicians, and King's enemies. For example, in 1960, Adam Clayton Powell, as you can see here, in response to a conflict of King, threatened to expose a sexual relationship between King and Rustin. And although Powell's claims were false, the suggestion itself could have damaged King's image and the movement at the time. So unfortunately, with the exception of brief correspondence, this was the end of Rustin and King's close partnership until the 1963 March on Washington. Wow. Well, to us, this may seem simply like a very petty way to end an otherwise successful 
alliance during a critical period in American history. But we have to remember that gay people were seen in a very different light compared to today. Civil rights organizations and some leaders succumbed to respectability politics or the belief that adhering to social norms and morality will lead to racial advancement. And given that the dominant view in American society was that LGBT people were immoral and deviant, it was hard for Rustin to become the figurehead of the campaigns he led without public opinion turning against the civil rights movement. So we invite educators actually and students to also consider the politics of representation. How does the media impact this phenomenon, for example, in the 1950s and 1960s? Mm -hmm. A very important point to consider indeed. And, and meanwhile, while he had nearly four decades of activism under his belt, Rustin did not slow down for the causes that mattered most to him. A very significant piece of his later activism was his dedication to gay liberation. The LGBT organi organizations that formed out of the mid 20th century demand for visibility and the equal rights by the 1980s had created a climate conducive to Rustin and others who were LGBT to advocate for legislation to prevent discrimination and, and anti-LGBT violence and government aid in the, government aid and the AIDS ep epidemic, which disproportionately impacted gay and bisexual men. He spent the late 1980s lobbying the mayor and city council on behalf of the coalition for lesbian and gay rights to add sexual orientation to the list of protected categories in its human rights code. And his efforts weren't limited to lobbying for gay uh, rights legislation either. He wrote about his life and gave interviews to activists, journalists, and scholars, providing a window into his thoughts and, experience and experiences in each of these movements. These movements, which represent a series of moments in which activists changed the social, political, and economic fabric of American society over the long 20th century, intersected in ways that demonstrate the power of social justice. So in one of his interviews, Rustin talks about the continuing struggle for human rights by comparing the mobilization of LGBT people in the late 20th century to the earlier civil rights movement. And this and this interview is titled From Montgomery to Stonewall, 1986. And in it, he states, consider now gay rights. In 1969, in New York of all places, in Greenwich Village, a group of gay people were in the bar. Recall that the 1960s was a period of extreme militancy. There were anti-war demonstrations, civil rights demonstrations, and women's rights demonstrations. The patrons of the bar added gay rights demonstrations to the list. The events began when several cops moved into the bar to close it down, a very common practice in that period, forcing many gay bars to go underground. The cops were rough and violent. And for the first time in the history of the United States, gays as a collective group fought back. And not just that night, but the following night and the next and the night after that. That was the beginning of an extraordinary revolution, similar to the Montgomery bus boycott and that it was not expected that anything extraordinary would occur. Just a year after this interview, Rustin passed away at the age of 75. And as we look back over Rustin's life, there are many things left to be said about his contributions and his legacy. One of the main takeaways for me at least is the significance of equality and human rights during his lifetime and even today. We may take for granted the rights and legal protections that allow marginalized groups a voice in our current political and social environment. But these were not without major sacrifices from committed activists and coalitions. And Rustin's story shows us what it means to be a dedicated activist amidst setbacks. But he also understood that the struggle would continue beyond his lifetime. I'm sure many of you can think of social causes that are still important today. And as you consider these causes, you might think back to what we've talked about and find inspiration in the lives of people like Rustin. You might also make connections to current events or understand the history of, US, of the U.S. in a new way. And so although this is only the life story of one person, I hope you feel encouraged to study other lesser known historical figures and events that shaped the course of history. We hope you found this video interesting and learned something new about Bayer Rustin. For more information about his life, feel free to take a look at the references on the last page of this video.
We also want to encourage you to check out Montgomery Pride United's website and social media pages to connect with our community. Visit MontgomeryPrideUnited.org or at Montgomery Pride on Instagram and Facebook. And you can also find us at the Byard Rustin Community Center and Thrift Store too. We're located at 635 Madison Avenue, Avenue in downtown Montgomery. We hope to see you soon. Take care, y'all.